Oh, Diana, one question I went to ask before we jumped yes. on. How do you pronounce your last name so I don't get it wrong? Giovanazzo. Giovanazzo. Okay, everybody, we have Diana Giovanazzo here. I'm so excited to have her to celebrate Antoinette's, Antoinette's sister, which she has a beautiful poster of it behind her. And I have my shiny grubby copy that I've had my hands all over. <laughs> uh, this is so fun. I'm going to... um do a little intro and then I have some questions and those of you who've been here before you know I have quite I'll take questions at the end so Diana Giovinazzo is the co-creator of Wine Women and Words a weekly literary podcast which I love and I have been on featuring interviews with authors over a glass of wine cheers by the way yeah, cheers. Yeah. <laughs> cheers Diana is active within her local literary community as the president of the Los Angeles chapter of the Women's National Book Association. For more information, she, her re website is dianagivinazzo.com. And her first novel was The Women in Red, which was hailed as an epic tale of one woman's fight to create the life of her dreams. It's a sweeping novel. It was a sweeping novel based on Anita Garibaldi, a 19th century Brazilian revolutionary who loved as fiercely as she fought for freedom. And that blurb is from Adriana Trigiani, who's amazing. So that's a pretty amazing blurb. Um, Antoinette's sister. Um, this book has, I, I loved it. And I just want to read a couple of the glowing reviews that you received from, it was a starred review on publishers. I know, it's so exciting. Yeah, <laughs> um, offers an exceptional portrait of 18th century Austria's Har Habsburg royal dynasty. This sprawling tale of power, intrigue, and ambition is a winner. And then the other one um, from Booklist, also great review. Um, Philippa Gregory fans, and I thought I immediately thought of Philippa Gregory when I started reading it. Um, will love this story's mix of real history and drama, made personal with the strong and relatable voice of the Queen of Naples and Sicily. And I couldn't agree more with that one. So, welcome! Thank you for coming. Thank you. Hey, I love that. It's a couple of people brought up Philippa Gregory, and it was a surreal moment because I've read almost all her books, as so many of us have. Yes. And so to have that comparison within the story, I was just like, was yeah, like, oh. amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Nice. yeah. Oh, totally. I, I think that um, a lot of authors of historical fiction, like us, like Philippa Gregory is one of these ones that were like, ooh, and grew up reading and, you know, yes. it's all of that. So, mm -hmm. so what, I mean, what a great comparison. Um, so tell us about Maria Carolina Charlotte, sister of Marie Antoinette, and how you were inspired to write her story. Uh, well, Maria Carolina Charlotte, obviously, as the name says, she was Marie Antoinette's sister. She was one of 16 children. And <laughs> it is, it is <laughs> ridiculously so many children. Yeah. Um, as somebody who wrote the book, I can attest to the fact that that is a lot. Uh, <laughs> yes. And, they were the two sisters were extremely close and by happenstance and fate what have you she becomes the queen of the two sicilies which was a kingdom that ranges just north of naples and it went all the way down to what's now sicily and she had to take over control of the country and become she was one of the one of three women to actually stand up to napoleon and fight for her country and deal with the loss of her sister yeah just unbelievable and it's one of these lesser known stories of women in history that I love that you know you just mind and and also I love it because it was refreshing for me because I've been reading you know I write World War II lately and I've been reading a lot of 20th century so to go mm -hmm. back and read about um you know this portion of history was so great and I have to I want to talk first a little bit about um her mother who was a force Maria Carolina Charlotte, um, uh, no, it, that is one of Maria Theresa's daughters, ninth daughter and 16th child of Empress Maria Theresa of Austria. That was Antoinette, that was Marie Antoinette's and Marie Charlotte's sister. I mean, mother. Mother, yeah. Gonna, <laughs> I know there's so many. Right. Yeah, yeah. There's a reason why we have the family chart in the beginning of the book. Exactly. I kept looking back. So <laughs> Maria Theresa, Empress Maria Theresa of Austria was a force of nature. And I just have to read this reviewer, um, excuse my language, because I thought it was so great. One reviewer said, Maria Theresa 
was the OG momager of Europe. Chris Jenner wishes she was this much of a conniving, power amassing, power amassing bitch, my dudes. <laughs> she married all her children into powerful positions, maneuvering them across Europe like living chess pieces. And I was like, that's so perfect. <laughs> so it's just- <laughs> so perfect. That's so I love that review. Oh my God. This there's some there's some amazing reviews that come out that I've seen that are just fantastic. And I feel like that's one of my favorites now. Yeah, so talk to me about the mom, because she was, like, such a force. She was. So prior to her coming in, there weren't really these massive families. There was, like, maybe one or two kids, and they would die off. Um, In her case, there were, um, I don't even, if I'm trying to remember, but I don't even think there were sons, if I'm not mistaken. There were only daughters, in her case, and her they didn't have the laws like you have in England where a woman can actually succeed, you know, with the problem and all that. So the king had to go and get a le- or a decree from another country to be able to say that this woman could rule. And he only had three daughters, Maria Teresa being the oldest. And so he had to get support from a neighbor- neighboring area to be able to say that she could rule. And when she did, you know, she, it was in the time, during her time, as I mentioned, with just so many few kids, that's why we had a lot of these wars of course succession because there was nobody left and everybody was coming in to fight for this territory. Right. And with her husband, they end up having these 16 children and she <laughs> deliberately, strategically places them in various points of power throughout Europe and I just that alone was fascinating to me and prior to her coming into power her father had lost the rule of the kingdom of the two Sicilies the kingdom of two Sicilies it was there was Sicily which was the northern part which you know I say northern it's the Naples area which you consider Naples to Calabria and then there was Sicily the island and then when they came into power under him they just called it the two Sicilies or the kingdom of the two Sicilies. So he controlled that along with Austria and so many other areas. And when he started losing all of that, she started using her children as literally as pawns. There's no shining around it. She had a child in Parma. She had a child in Milan, in Tuscany, and then the kingdom of the two Sicilies. She had children there. She put some of her, you know, northern area, um, you know, around Prussia. And then she also then, it was very important to her that she also have a child within the French royal line. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah and I, I mean, you could almost do a prequel about her just because there's, there's so much, there's so much there. Oh, yes. It's amazing. Oh, yeah. It amazing. Is. Um, so that, you know, as you're talking about this, I'm like, oh my God, so much research. And so talk to me about, you have a list on Goodreads of some of the books mm-hmm. you use for the research. Um, you know, I'd love to hear about your process, the research process, how much you did. Do you do it all up front? Do you do it as you go? Like, tell me about that. This was the kind of book where you had to go do it as you went along. I feel like there was just so much. And with the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies, it, um, it was really complicated. There, polit- everything politically and historically just had to be really, you know, you had to go you know, step by step with it, almost like picking out grains of rice from the sand because there was just so much. And to be able to put that into a historical narrative, like one of the things I had to do was, um, oh, I there's so many characters names I'm constantly forgetting, but the one, uh, there's a, the guy who's also her, he's a physician and he is the minister, the minister of war, the head military guy. And he's these, two people historically he was actually um he was the her you know her physician but he had somebody else in power for the military but he the the physician was acting through him and so he had the influence on it so for the story I was like this is too good not to not to you know do and so instead of like breaking off into two people and having all this other stuff I had to um, go ahead and just combine it into one character because he was basically doing all of that. Doing the job, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So there was a lot of it. So I started off 
as I always do, I start off with a biography, a biography about the person uh, specifically. And the one that I had that I started off with was by a Mary Byrne, which she's done a number of books about um, women in general. Um, I believe she did a uh, Marie Antoinette one. Uh, there are a number of them, but the key thing is that she was writing these in 1911. And this one was that I did was in, published in 1911. And then um, I, there was a, a woman by the name of Chinsia Rekia, who is the foremost expert on Maria Carolina Charlotte. So there were, she had books about her and you know, all these articles about her and her life as important, like the, an actual comparison between the two sisters. And Great. so I oh, use, perfect. I looked at her stuff. Yeah. And then um, uh, Lou uh, Mandela, uh, who's on the list uh, of my, uh, my website, he was, you know, so helpful when it came to just getting into the politics of the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies. Yes. Yeah. Cause all, yeah, very elaborate. Um, so, I, you know, I loved um, your author's note at the end, and I don't want to give away any spoilers, but how you talk about how after Antoinette died and was was eviscerated by the French, by French writers, then they did the same thing to Charlotte. Mm -hmm. And she had all these incredible accomplishments. Um, and they and she was kind of, you know, the, the, she, her husband was given credit for pretty much everything. Like, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, I mean, not like small ones, like bringing coffee to Naples building palaces and theaters, like so much. And they just, oh, yeah. yeah, and just completely ignored by history, which is mm -hmm. what happens with men, women often. But um, but yeah, tell me a little bit about that. So some of the interesting things that happened, they were, and this is one of the things where I just, I love Mary's uh, work because she was just like, they went out of their way to say that he was doing this stuff when it came to like the universities and things of that nature. Um, other things, interestingly, it was, um, she was doing the letters because the letters are very important to her. But when she was doing letters and doing decrees, she, was, she wasn't sending them under her name, she was sending them under his name. And so what she would do is she'd have him come in and he'd come by and they'd sit at her desk and she, everything would be what she wanted and she'd just sign them. And she'd hand them over to him and he'd just sign them and then go on his merry way. So a lot of the stuff that she was doing was giving credit to, to him. And there were some other things, like the one that I put in the author's note, um, ja um, Jaquim uh, Morat, whatever, I just call him Morat. I don't like him <laughs> in general. It's kind of funny when you're writing historical fiction, I don't know if you do this, but you have these very visceral reactions to these people in history, especially oh, yeah. when you're doing a specific character or person or character because you see it through their eyes. Mm -hmm. so like, <laughs> but one of the things is that he always gets the credit for burial practices in Italy when in turn it was um uh, Maria Carolina who was doing that and I mean I can go on and on with that I mean yes, from the coffee so, to the, so much yeah to the olives the olives were a big thing which I just I got so into that I even consulted <laughs> we're talking about historical research here I got, I consulted a volcanologist on this from my alma mater, Cal State. <laughs> oh, <that's Bulletin>. amazing. <laughs> well, it's so funny how you go down rabbit holes and you're like, you just have to know, even if it doesn't end up in the book, you just have to know for yourself sometimes, I think. Uh -huh. <laughs> like, uh -huh. Yeah. Um, so I'm really interested too about, you wrote this in the first person and she was like this feisty, headstrong personality and uh, what made you decide first person? I love, I personally love first person because I feel like it really puts you in the story in a way that other yeah. um, points of view don't. Sorry, that's my dog barking out the door. Um, but so what, why first person? Um, I'm the same as you where I like having it, the, the view from her perspective. And I think this is, she, her story was one where like others, like Nita Garibaldi, like I had wrote, written about, she didn't really get to have her say too much. Everything's been written about, you know, what there is about her, which is amazing because having a queen, is, this is something that Philippa Gregory had talked about, where with a queen, you can say exactly what she wore that day. I could look up for Marie Antoinette and see what she wore on any particular day, right. just like a face of the moon. And 
for her, it, but with all of that, with Maria Carolina, where you could see her daily schedule, where you could see what she was doing, you couldn't actually see her side of things. And I really wanted to see her side of things, especially given the fact that even though she was Marie Antoinette's most favorite sister, she still gets shoved under the rug. There are still, yeah. there are still books on the Habsburg that, the Habsburgs that I read that didn't even mention her. Really? Oh, yeah. that's amazing. And yeah. Marie Antoinette, they kind of brush it off too. And that was just really frustrating. So I, I really wanted her to be able to, or at least I, have her have some sort of say in, in this yeah. grand sense of things, which is kind of, you know, as I say that, it kind of feels a little, um, oh, how do I put it? Um, egotistical to say that she wants to have the say, even though I'm the author putting the, this together, but just getting an insight into what her viewpoints were on these things. Yeah, and I and and the voice is so fun. You know, I mean, it's so like it's so strong, and and she was so ahead of her time, and and her personality was so strong. That must have been really fun for you to write. You it know? was, it was, yeah. especially when she was younger, because she still had that childish about her. Because she was sixteen years old when she got married, and she ends up coming into her own and power by the time she's twenty years old. So just having that sense of character aging and whatnot was just so much fun to delve into yeah yeah i love her all, all the characters i love creating all of them oh that's so great um i let i want to talk to you too i like your i liked your use of letters to move the narrative forward i, I know i i do that too sometimes and um and so two questions this is like a two-part question how did you make the decision to do that and are they based on real historical letters or did you just make them up from scratch so the letters themselves were based on letters that they were sending. So when I started doing the research, I was um, very early on, I could see she was sending letters, Maria Teresa was sending her letters. There were these, all these letters going back and forth. And so I really wanted those letters to be a part of it. I was like, wow, these letters are really important to her. And I want to try to integrate them in some way. But as much as I love epistolatory novels, I believe I said that right. I know I didn't say it because right. I always like spit it out wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it. That's close enough. <laughs> oh, okay, we'll go with that. Yeah. Uh, my own flair on it. Right. Um, I love these letters in the novels and those the ones that just are all letters. And I wanted to have a touch of that in the story itself because they were important to her. Um, that I wanted to have. And I also wanted to have her family's influence. That was right. really important to me too. Yep. Because even though they're in other countries, they're still a huge influence on her. And the only way during this time period I could do that was through letters. Right. And it also, you know, you're telling it in the first person, but then it gives other perspectives and points of view in a kind of great way. Like it works really well. So that was cool. Mm -hmm. um, Thanks. Yeah. I thought it was pretty fun when Having that letter from Leopold to Joseph and Leopold's like, I don't think this is going to actually come out well. We better be prepared. That was an actual letter that he sent to him. Oh, I that, love stuff like that. I just love yeah. it. You know, like, yeah. yeah, these these history things, that whole, you know, Maria Teresa scolding her, you know, you say your prayers like a, <laughs> like a fly. You, you don't yeah. have the attention span. And it's like, that was a letter she actually sent to her daughter. They live in the same palace. And she sends her this letter. Amazing. Um, yeah. it, it was like, they yeah. have to be a part of it. Yeah, very, yeah so great. Um, so I, I, in terms of your writing, I ask every writer who comes on this question because I'm always interested. Um, are you a plotter? Do you plot things out? Or are you a pantser? Do you write by the seat of your pants? Like how, what's your process? I'm a planster. Oh, you're in between. Okay. I'm in between. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, so my co-host Michelle and I, we laugh about this all the time yeah. because She's very atypical. She likes everything a certain way. Everything's all, you know, just so with her home. And she just flies by the seat of her pants. She's very much a pantser. I'm the complete opposite. I mean, you have this lovely background before me, but you don't see the rest of my like office, which is just covered in papers and stuff because <laughs> it's been a messy few weeks. And so in my real life, I'm very much just plants fly by the seat of my pants. But when it comes to my books, I have this guideline and it, I treat it much like the Pirates of the Caribbean where they're, it's a, the outline is like a guideline. I stray from that because the story needs me to, 
then so be it. Mm -hmm. But I have this solid place where I can always go back to. Right. That's kind of why I say that I'm a planster because I allow myself to deviate from that spot if I have to. Yeah, that makes total sense. Do you, um, can I ask you to do Microsoft Word? Are you a Scrivener girl? Like, what do you like to use? I'm a Scrivener girl. Me too. Yeah. (laughs) I'm still learning the intricacies of Scrivener. Me too. (laughs) But um, this book, I I don't think I could have done uh, Antoinette's sister without Scrivener, if that's, you know, too too much of a commercial. I I completely agree. And just to explain what um, Scrivener is, it's it's, I made myself with my second novel, use Scrivener, because I was such a mess with the first mm-hmm. one with research. And I, it, it, Scrivener is a word processing program for long documents, whether it's mm-hmm. like thesis papers or books or novels. And it allows you to organize the manuscript and the research in a, in one place. And that's what mm-hmm. I love about it. I know it is a Scrivener commercial basically, but <laughs> like, and it's pretty cheap too, which is amazing. <laughs> so you can start paying you for it now. I know. Um, yeah. they, could, they can also do that for the podcast. And I think that would be a really, if there are any of them listening, you need there to you do go. this, you get yeah, the podcast yeah. and then you get the writers. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you know that you could highlight your stuff on the side? On the left side panel, there's like a way that you could highlight. So you could base it on like the locations or on like names um, what happened see I feel like I use like 10 percent of of the capabilities of oh same same <laughs> yeah. but I, Kate Quinn posted about that on social media and I was like oh my god this is like game changing oh, I need to look that up okay yeah, yeah. So, so I, I don't think I've used that yeah you need to look it up it's really cool um yeah but with the letters it was I had the letters and I kind of had them plotted out as to where I wanted them but there are a few that moved around and just having that ability to have where you've got the story and then you and then I had the letter underneath, I could pull that story and, or that letter and put it into another part of the story. So the main thing is really easy for me to do as opposed to Word where you have to go and pick it up and put it in, you know, oh, yeah. Yeah. copy paste and things get crazy. So, so much, <laughs> yeah, or you lose stuff and yeah, nightmare. So, so. I have a tendency once... Once I have a good working draft, then I'll pull it from Scrivener and I'll put it into um, to Microsoft Word, especially because the publishing industry prefers everything in Microsoft so like, Word. Yeah, that, it's yeah. Same, same here. Yeah, the, the, mm-hmm. I dump it in towards, you know, when I'm close enough to, to do that. But um, mm-hmm. but yeah, so other, in terms of the writing process too, so is there, part, is there a part you absolutely love and is there a part you absolutely dread? Like what's, what's your favorite and what's the one part that you <sighs> like the least? I love the editing. Me too. Which is so yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, I was like, yeah. <laughs> that's where you get to, I already have something in the works. Yes. I could play with, I've got my, my stuff and I can just go ahead and play with it and create the story. Um, and so I love it. But that'll come back. Okay. okay. There you go. <laughs> um, and so I love that. I love having that, that play that I can work with. Um, Drafting, I think, is possibly my least favorite because you're at the start of that, you're at the bottom of the hill, got to get up over that hill, and you just got to just dump everything out, and it's not as pretty as you want it to be, and it's just blah on the page. And so, yeah. you have, but you creating that play that you can go ahead and make something pretty with. Yeah, I, I that's I am the exact same. Some I know some writers love that part, like the drafting part. For, but for mm-hmm. me, that's the hardest, and also that kind of like self critic on my shoulder the whole time, like makes it harder to like just get it down. You know, yeah. so I'm working on that. But yeah, yeah. I, I I push through it. That's one of the things I I try to draft as quickly as possible. I mean, this one I drafted super quickly. Super I started quickly. it in March of 2020, and I finished in August of 2020. That is just drafting. This is the drafting part, just the drafting. But seriously, like with all the research and everything, like that's, that's super fast. Good for you. It is. (laughs) Yeah. It is where I was still on the phone. I was still reading the biography when my agent called and we were discussing what to do. And I pitched it to her Uh, before I'd even finished Maria Carolina's (laughs) biography. (laughs) And that's where like, okay, yes, this is the book we need. And so that's when I started to to get into it. Yeah. And it was literally, quite literally, two weeks before the world lockdown 
Yeah, I was editing during that time and I talked to writers who had to write drafts from scratch during that time. And I don't, I don't know how you did it. I really, don't, I'm not sure I could, could have had found the headspace to do that. So that was, that's really impressive too. This room helped a lot. I lived yeah. in this room a lot. I, um, I just closed off the doors and I have no TV in here. It's yeah. just me, my computer and music. And that's just what I did for four months straight is just being in here with my books in this world while the rest of the world was burning yeah yeah that's what you have to do though like, mm -hmm. especially yeah good that's a lot of perseverance um <laughs> do you so um the cover is gorgeous and it's right behind you and I have this this uh, early copy here um do you have say in covers people always ask about covers do you have do you have say Yes, yeah, yes and no. Yeah. Um, Grand Central has a wonderful art department. I will see their pretties and put in a, a commercial for them as well. Yeah. And for this one, they gave me, for the woman in red, they just handed me, they just sent it to me and it was just perfect. They didn't even need to make any changes or anything. And this time they gave me about, I want to say eight options. And this was the first one. Oh, and yeah, it's it right off the bat. This they is just the nailed it. Wanted. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's so funny that happens sometimes. I love it. Yeah, beautiful. Um, and so I have a couple more questions. And then if anyone okay. has questions, please put them in the chat or put them in the Q&A and I will check. Um, do you have plans to travel to Italy anytime soon now? <laughs> yes, I'm hoping for we're, we're kind of still keeping an eye on the whole world stuff, yeah, but unfortunately. Yeah damn Putin um <laughs> making it's you know just when everything's opening up and there's this world that breaks out and it's like okay do we want to travel um right we're right. hoping knock on wood that we can go this year we've had to we had a trip plan for 2020 but as you can guess it got postponed right. and then last year with the variants and Italy had um I want to say it's kind of crazy. They had like the almost like the way they did in Hawaii with how to be able to get there oh, and yeah, uh, deal yeah. with it. That my husband and I were like, you know what, we're gonna just wait a little bit longer and and not go. And which is nice because we got to take a trip back east and visit nice. with family. Um, so we're hoping for this year. We gotta wait for a few things, um, but we're hoping that this year will finally be the year I can go back to Italy. I've been I to hope Italy. So too. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Everybody's putting their fingers in. Right. Cross, cross your fingers for me. Fingers and toes. Knock on all the wood. Honestly. Um, so yeah. So tell readers. Um, I mean, listeners rather about wine, women, and words. Your podcast because it's so great, and I just want to give that a plug too, and um, and talk about like how often you do it and all that. Oh, thank you. I, I'm glad that you, I also tell Michelle that you also think that it's great. <laughs> I um, this was a labor of love. Uh, Michelle and I got it started. Michelle is my co-host. I have mentioned previously. Mm -hmm. uh, she and I have been friends for. God, almost 20 years now. Um, we worked together and at this terrible travel agency. We would trade books back and forth. And about not, almost six years ago now, she messaged me and said, hey, I've got this project that I've got to do for my journalism uh, program, and it's going to be a podcast. And the name of the podcast, and by the way, is When Women in Words. Yes. <laughs> yes. And that's what she was like, this is what it's going to be called. And I was like, that sounds great. I have no idea how to do a podcast. And she was like, oh, neither do I. This is going to be fun. <laughs> and so here we are six years later. Yeah. We got, that first year we took our, got our bearings and we just had, we just have so much fun. Um, as you can tell, which I, I love with yours, you got the happy hour thing going. Obviously I had to have my cocktail uh, with <laughs> nice. me. Yeah. 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 Um, and we just, we drink, it's, we're, we're the anti-NPR, I don't know if it's necessarily like you can say that, we're, we're um, the opposite of that, we drink wine and we talk books, um, if we can get an author uh, drinking with us, <laughs> Jane, um, we'll get some really funny stories out of them too, so it's just, it's on a lot of ways, it's also like a master class for, for writers, because we like yeah. to get into how you did things and you can tell how where we are with our current work so we're like okay so how did you do this the multiple perspectives how yes, did that yes. go yeah, yeah all of that stuff <laughs> yeah 
Yeah, no, I highly recommend it. Wine, women, and words, and it's anywhere you can download it, like Apple, anywhere, pretty much. Anywhere, so, yeah, yeah. So, and then um, my other question before I take questions is, how um, best to get in, keep in touch with you on social media? Like, what do you prefer? And also, do you use Zoom book clubs? Um, yes, I do Zoom book clubs. I will do any book club that wants to have me. I will be more than happy to join in. Uh, I. I am a delight. Um, <laughs> Cheers to that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, uh, social media, I uh, my handles are easy. I prefer um, Instagram and Twitter, and that's Diana G. Author. Make it simple because of this enormous last name. Uh, and then I also have my newsletter, uh, which you can go to uh, through my website, dianaguffinazzo.com. Awesome. Um, okay, so we have a couple questions. Oh, yeah. Um, Mary Witherington asks, what one thing did you learn about Charlotte through your research that shocked or surprised you the most? That's an excellent question. Ooh. Taking a drink because I'm thinking about what shocked me the most about her. Um, how much to try to get her sister to her. That was something where I never stopped to consider that, the fact that it, that really, devastated her what her sister was going through and you got to consider the fact that they also had divine right was very much a thing and so she was taught that you this is a a very big thing and god-given uh right that she had and they were what was happening with her sister just devastated her and she tried everything to get her sister to go with her to italy where she wanted she wanted Marie Antoinette there with her and it almost happened but she wouldn't leave her family and that was uh, another thing that surprised me with Marie uh, Antoinette is how much she was you know she went they all it was all of them in a, and yeah, yeah. I think uh, that had a hand in how things played out and then after the fact um, before her son died she was petitioning to have her son be sent to the kingdom of the two Sicilies to be a ward under Maria Carolina. And then that really just took me back how much she was involved in trying to save her sister. Yeah, that's amazing. And imagine like how history would have changed if, if any of that had happened, you know, like it's yeah. really interesting to me that those kind of twists of fate and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, Adam, Autumn Shaw has a question. Hi, Autumn. Um, how do you organize your research? Time periods, articles, internet books, et cetera. And do you talk to historians or any experts to check your research? I know from your notes that's of some of this, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I'll talk to the historians if I have questions. Um, and like Lou was such a wonderful, wonderful person. Um, I was able to email with him if I had any questions or anything like that. I had already read his books when I was put in touch with him, you know, introduce. And so he's wonderful. I highly recommend all of his books as well. If you want that nonfiction take on the kingdom of the two Sicilies. Um, and so, yeah, I would just talk. And then there were some people who are, I, I was so, I would say experts in the culture of the, of Naples, because, you know, with Italy, it's one of those things, that's not kind of like the United States where you have each area has their own players, their own food and their own culture. And it's very prominent and strong there. So I would talk to some people within um, the Neapolitan culture about certain things. And so that we would be able to talk to them about that. So that was something that was so beneficial for me, um, especially when it came to like the food and, and the culture and general stuff, like their version of Carnival, which yesterday was Fat Tuesday. So Carnival season uh, would be happening, you know, to yeah. happen right now for them. So that was something that was very um, intricate to it. And for, um, organizing um again i am chaos <laughs> in my home so i like i use a cross between i have the physical books and i will highlight and tab everything that mm -hmm. is prominent for me but i also like using ebooks for my research because with my ebooks i can actually um i have the highlights there so i can just go back to the highlights and see the, hi uh, the highlights that's really true. easily yeah. so that's been really helpful as well Mm -hmm. But for my research, um, I not too much organization, unfortunately. Um, I kind of feel like I, I fail in that. Do you um, dump a bunch of that into Scrivener or not so much? Um, 
I I will. I'll put like I'll put it in like the notes with the outlines, but I I go back to the books themselves with the highlights of it. Yeah. Okay. Oh, and I'll put in like and and in the outline I'll put um C page fifty eight of this book for, uh, for yeah, that. Yeah, I do that. I'll do yeah. that. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Remember that part. Yeah. Autumn Shaw says, "Oh, I never thought of using eBooks that way, and that's true. Like I've used that eBooks that way so sometimes, but not mm -hmm. not as much. That's a good that's a good suggestion. And there's a few like with um the one of the big books for Maria Carolina. Um, there was one that was I have only I had to buy it a rent as a rental because it was just so expensive, and so, and I only needed one uh, chapter, right? And it was like some book that was like a four hundred dollars. So and I just needed just the one chapter, right?" Right. And so I rented it just and just for that one chapter, so I was able to keep that, um, just the highlights of that portion of this book, and I was able to do that. Oh, me. that's perfect. Yeah, that's yeah. Great. great idea. Sometimes, yeah, the cost of the books you gotta the ebooks will help you. That's in right. That regards, yeah. 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 Um, other questions. What are you reading right now? Um, I am listening to the reading list. Okay. Um, it's it's this lovely book. Um, it's kind of, it's the nice fluffy. I, I, I don't want to say, I kind of want to say fluffy. It's kind of fluffy. Um, it's a story about love and loss and both just, and the love of reading and connection that books can, can bring to you. Oh, who's that um, by? Oh gosh. I don't, let me see if I, I can pull it up real fast. Um, oh, without it. Sorry. <laughs> Um, it is by, um, no, where is the, didn't, it's not coming up for the, I oh, want to see it's Sarah, Sarah Nisha Adams. Michelle Kelleher just said that. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Sarah Nisha Adams, the reading list. Um, yes. Okay. Thank I am, you. <laughs> thank you, Michelle. I am currently reading. I'm actually listening on audiobook because I'm in the midst of deadline time and I, I don't have a lot of time, free time to read and so I'm re I'm listening to David Grohl's The Storyteller the oh, head of the, I love the, that yeah, one. The, the head of the Foo Fighters and um yes it's, it's so like it's perfect for what I need right now on audiobook it's like he just tells stories of his life in Nirvana and his life in the Foo Fighters and mm -hmm. it's great it's really good yeah yeah sometimes you just need that just something different something totally fresh. different yeah totally different sometimes you just need that audio book yes so, yeah. you're just sometimes sitting down with a book can be even for authors can be just too much I like today I sat down with a book for maybe five minutes before I was getting messages and stuff carrying pulling me away from the book so sometimes just having that audio book exactly go, go yeah. for a run or walk or whatever mm -hmm. in the car it's so great and um and you know like I love reading historical fiction and I love reading yours because it wasn't 20th century I have a hard time reading World War II or 20th century when I'm writing it because I don't mm -hmm. like it. I don't like anything to bleed into my my stuff. So, so you know <laughs> what I mean? Like you don't want any like, yeah. So um, so I like reading other genres or other eras because it's too too close um, mm -hmm. in terms of what I'm working on. Um, and then oh that that leads me to another question. Did you ever think about writing outside of historical fiction genre, or are you gonna like kind of stay stick with this? I plan on sticking with historical fiction. Um, I, my everything seems to flow better for me with historical fiction. That's I love reading it. Historical fiction is my jam. Yeah, this is what I want to do, and so I kind of yeah. want to stick to it. Maybe sometime I might do a contemporary novel, maybe someday. Mm -hmm. But because um, that's the other genre I have a tendency to read is contemporary. Obviously, yeah. reading this and whatnot. Right, um, right. But I think primarily gonna, I'm going to stick with historical fiction. Yes, same here. Yeah, I, and I look kind of like the history as a jumping off point, um, mm -hmm. you know, for it, just to have that kind of base for, yeah, for yeah. the story. Yeah. Um, well, this was lovely. Thank you very much thank for your you. time. It was so great. And thank you everyone for coming. There's all, um, Mandy, thank you, Mandy Eisenbaum says, hi again, thanks for another lovely chat. Italy is one of my favorite places and I'm excited to read this historical book. Um, Oh, and Mindy Elric's here too. Oh, had to go, but thank you for such an interesting discussion. I look forward to reading Diana's book. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Diana. Thank this you. is so great. Keep in touch. Cheers. Yes. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. Have care. a wonderful evening, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.